Okay, hi everybody. I'm going to talk today about how to effectively use open source software in an enterprise environment. Uh, I'm Steve Wong. I'm a software engineer uh, employed by VMware, but I've been working on the Kubernetes open source project since 2015. I've also uh, been a contributor to the Apache Mesos project. So I'm assigned to actually work on the open source bits. Um, you know, you might think this is simple, that using open source software just entails downloading it and using it. But uh, I'm going to explain to you how an open source project is actually working behind the curtains. You know, how does that, how does that software actually get developed, tested, distributed? Uh, where to go to get more help? Uh, how to get actual responsive treatment when you have bugs to submit or feature requests? Uh, how to evaluate the health of an open source project. You know, there are probably literally tens of thousands of those things, and for any given use case, you might find there are four or five of them. How do you decide which one you ought to use? You know, there are actually some things you can go look at that will tell you whether this open source project is alive and well, has a growing community of users and contributors, versus one that's kind of got one foot in the grave. Um, uh, and then, you know, like I say, how to get responsiveness. So the typical open source project works like this. It starts with a uh, source co code repo. They're usually GitHub. Uh, there are a handful of them that are on GitLab instead. These are uh, publicly accessible, internet hosted source code repositories. Microsoft recently acquired GitHub uh, there's been some talk of people who, because of that, might prefer GitLab, but I haven't honestly seen a whole lot of movement. Um, you go look at that source code repository, and you can typically just discover that with a Google search. And what you'll find there is a license, uh, a getting started usage readme document, some governance rules, and a list of releases. Sometimes they actually compile, the, those releases come with compiled uh, binaries ready to use, sometimes they don't, and they expect you to do that final step yourself. Um, an example here is this link to the Kubernetes project. You probably do want to look at the license depending on how you want to use that, because the, I, I'm, I'm just going to give you that advisory and I can't give you the legal advice, but there's anything from an Apache 2 license that is pretty unencumbered. Uh, you could. You know, consult your own attorneys, but I think you can generally just use that without a worry, uh, to some other forms of licensing where that, whereby if you modify it, uh, the things that you might do with those modifications have to be open sourced as well. So the license may be something you want to look at. Uh, the README document is really generally, for most projects, a broad overview and it might link to more information, but it's kind of the aerial view uh, instructions for what you're getting into and what the thing does. It does not explain how to be an actual developer on this thing or how to customize it, build it on your own. Uh, the governance rules are something on the bigger projects that are more than one, one person projects. They'll explain kind of the social engagement rules that you're expected to abide by when you're on this project They'll often have the instructions on how to support, how to submit issues, how to contribute code, who owns the repository so that if you do contribute code, they just don't take code submissions from anyone without review for obvious reasons. And those government's rules will give you a clue as to what the actual process is. Anything from an autocratic one-man approver to you know, committees and on the bigger ones, they're divided into things called SIGs, or special interest groups, typically. Um, then once again, you see the releases there. Uh, the workflow is generally that these projects start with one person or one organization just builds something and decides it's going to be open source. They get to pick the license and make those governance rules. They publish an initial version, appoint some project owners who have the admin authority on what gets in and what stays out, and um, it builds from there. Uh, bugs and feature requests accumulate and the general, the general process is either uh, 
creating these as issues in the GitHub repository or on Apache projects in particular, there's a system called JIRA and people compose JIRA tickets that uh, are appropriate for either reporting a bug or uh, putting forth a request for a change or feature enhancement. Uh, these, you record them as these issues. Uh, if you actually are going to submit source code to fix an issue or add a, add a feature, these are done by something called a pull request. And if you really do have to learn Git to know what that is, but it, it's, a, it's a standard method if you're under the Git source code control system to submit something. And these things will automatically get submitted to the project owners who ought to respond to it with comments, requests, or perhaps just check it in. Uh, uh, you know, these PRs typically accumulate into the master branch of this, so uh, they don't go in there automatically, but as they are, you've got a running tip of the project that can be tested, and they'll declare releases depending on the project, quarterly, annually, whatever. That's something that uh, kind of just varies by how many con contributions there are, how active this is. In the longer term, you know, the, the issues, feature requests are kind of short-term tactical changes. The longer term things of architectural destructions, of how you design APIs, big picture things of restructuring the whole project, those typically occur in these special interest groups. And what goes on there are design meetings, architectural discussions, uh, composing plans for what they want to target for getting in the next release or kick down the road for a later release. Uh, in my experience on these bigger projects like Kubernetes, which I work on, these meetings are online. They have developers all over the world and they have Zoom meetings where you join the organization and engage in these meetings. Maybe they're weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or as needed. The SIG activity would typically roll up into a higher level tier of governments on a large uh, project and that higher tier declares actual release candidates and finally releases. Uh, where do you go to learn more? Well, if it's a successful project, you should be able these days to find how-to videos on YouTube. You should be able to find blogs. Most of the bigger projects have an official blog and then users often write about it in other blogs. I'll give you a caution that like on Kubernetes, that is one of these high velocity projects with a lot of contributions and a big change rate. People write these blogs and they often, they, they ought to put a sell by date on these with Kubernetes, that sell by date should be something on the order of six months to 12 months, but you won't find it there. And the danger there is, it's rare that it's flat out wrong, but they'll say things in these blogs that maybe bubble up to the top of Google search results that say, Kubernetes doesn't have this, but maybe if it's old, it does now. Or, or they'll say, this is the best way to do it. But they've come up with enhancements such that it no longer is the best way to do it. Um, if you're in a big city, you'll find that on these popular open source projects, meetup.com is hosting mo monthly informally gatherings with invited speakers and users. Where I live in LA, for example, Kubernetes got so popular that it forked off into two independent meetup groups that meet monthly, one on the west side, one in the Burbank, Hollywood area. And I'd suggest to you that if you're in a major city that you just go to meetup.com and search uh, for whether there is a meetup on this because it's a great way to meet others and maybe in the longer term even enhance your career by uh, looking at other career, you know, career availability and things. The bigger ones have annual conferences. Like I say, I mentioned SIGs. Some of them have activity on Slack for support. Uh, Slack is what all the cool kids in Silicon Valley use as messaging, but some of the projects like Kubernetes have their own, uh, have their own Slack systems and you should join that and you can get, some of them have a lot of activity and a lot of opportunity for help and engaging with developers. On Kubernetes, the, uh, they have Slack channels for each individual SIG. Uh, a lot of them run mailing lists that, uh, in my experience, they're often under Google groups, but you join the mailing list and kind of older school, okay, five minutes left. Uh, uh, Stack Overflow, it, 
I don't know, on the ones I work on, Slack and the SIGs have more going on than Stack Overflow, but it, it is out there and it varies from one project to another. How do you evaluate project health? Well, you don't have to remember this, but what I'm suggesting, I've listed a bunch of open source projects. You can look at GitHub at the number of contributors. The stars, my honest opinion, GitHub stars are sort of a BS because you can award them to yourself. The number of commits going on, the number of bugs you see there. Uh, you can go look at the job search sites and see how many job openings actually mention that project and that's a good sign of it being healthy. Once again, I mentioned meetups occurring and meetup.com has a way you can even find the meetup membership. Um, there's something the CNCF does which monitors what's called velocity. On one axis here, you've got uh, PRs and issues and the other one is commits, but basically going off to that axis is better. The top three projects are Linux, uh, Chromium, which is Android phones and Kubernetes and they're way above the others. But in general, if you buy these stats, see a high velocity project, it's very healthy and there's a lot of people continuing to work on it and it, it's safe to bet that it won't disappear on you within the next couple years and that if issues are determined, they'll actually, they might actually get fixed. Um, how do you go? How do you get involved? Well, I'll tell you if this open source project is critical to your business, you should contribute. Now, contributions don't have to be source code. Well-written bug reports are very valid and appreciated means of contribution. Uh, so is documentation. The developers on the project will watch you do that. And when you put, you know, when you ask for your issue, issue resolution, my experience is they'll remember you and you're likely to get much more responsiveness. If you can't contribute, uh, it does make a difference, but I appreciate that in some organizations you can't. There are other ways to contribute. You could, uh, you could have your enterprise financially contribute or sponsor these projects. In a way, if you, if you engage in a commercial distribution, you're sort of outsourcing the contribution to your vendor where they're hiring engineers sort of on your behalf. And one way to look at it is that when you report the issues to them, they're bird dogging that on your behalf. But the contribution is important, and by doing it, even if you contribute to documentation, you know the internal structure of that, and you'll end up with a better experience. Um, that's it, thank you for your time.